just, re just remain standing for a moment. You know, today we're going to conclude our study in Genesis chapter 3, and uh, it's, it's almost impossible to um, have a normal church service on a, on a, a day like Father's Day and not think about the implication of it. I was thinking about Jonathan Edwards this morning, I always do on Father's Day. He was on his deathbed, wrote, wrote a letter to his daughter, that uh, his daughter that was taking care of him, as he, he knew he was dying. And uh, he said to her in the letter, as to my children, you're now left to be fatherless, which I hope will be an inducement to you all to seek a father who will never fail you. Isn't that a great word? And so how many of you have a dad that already went to heaven? And you say, boy, I feel fatherless. And I, I think, I think that, that's a reality. My dad, by the way, turns 99 years old today. He's still living. And, um, and, and people ask me, they, sometimes they say to me, Are you, do you think you're prepared um, for when your dad's going to die? Yes. Because though I may be at a time, point in time, fatherless from an earthly perspective, I have a father who will never fail me. And, and some of you feel that father wound in your life because you think, man, I didn't really, my father didn't really point me to the ultimate father. And the truth is, if you're here today, the ultimate father drew you to him. And you can look past the failures and the inadequacies and, the, and the, the, what you're missing from that earthly father. And I'm telling you, you can find it in a relationship with Jesus Christ. You can find the father that you've always been looking for. Let, let's, let's pray together. Father, we, we don't often think about this. It just kind of nags at us. And it's a burden that we carry that, that things are not always the way we want them to be in our life. And yet we know that there is an ultimate hope, an ultimate purpose, an ultimate plan for redemption, that we have to look outside of ourselves. We have to look past our disappointments. We have to look past the faults and failures of people that have let us down in the past. And we have to look past all that to look to you. And even as we go into the, the Word of God today, I pray that the Holy Spirit would come down in a powerful way in our life. Lord, we, we need you as, as we have been singing. We need, need you now. Lord, we want to know communion with you. We want to experience the reality of your presence. We want to know the love of the Father. We want to be able to, to revel in and rest in the gift of God's grace through the Son. And we need the comforting work of the Spirit of God to make the truth of God real to us today. I pray that that would happen to us as we go to the living, eternal Word of God. And may it feed us in ways, may it challenge us in ways, may it encourage us in ways that will be transforming as we look to live this life that you've given to us. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. you. may be seated. Let me just mention one thing real quick. I, I mentioned Father's Day, and, and again, happy Father's Day to every dad that's here. Um, I, I wish you were as good a dad as I am, but um, uh, I was actually at Walgreens last night. I was thinking about, I should just pick out my own Father's Day card and just get my kids to sign it, you know. Uh, I'll just kind of write a note to myself about um, how good I am as a dad. And um, then I decided that really wouldn't work. But uh, I, I do I love my kids. Glad they're here. And uh, love my dad. It just I don't get to be with him. All three of my brothers were ac actually with him today for his 99th birthday. <clears throat> he say, why didn't you go? He loves me so much. Um, and me being there will make up for, the, it takes three of them to make up for one of me. So um, I, will, I will be there in a few weeks, actually, and uh, celebrate his birthday. He, I, I, I think I told you last time I was with him, 
he said, how old am I? I said, well, you're 98. He goes, holy smokes. He said, how did I get to be that old? And uh, I said, well, I said, uh, do you want me to explain that to you biologically or how do you want me to explain that to you? And uh, he goes, well, how old are you? I said, well, how old do you think I am? He said, 75. I said, see, that's proof right there that your mind is, is broken. It just doesn't work anymore. And um, he was only 30 years off. So, <clears throat> all right, 13 years off, but uh, he was off. Hey, let me just mention one thing to you. Last week, we, uh, a couple weeks ago, we had a groundbreaking ceremony for our Oak Leaf campus. And then this week, we actually had uh, some equipment out there. They knocked down a bunch of trees and started doing the site work. And uh, we're wrapping up some, some of the financing um, and, and the final part of the financial plan to, to build that facility. It's a 16,500 square foot facility, which is a little bit, if you think about it, this, this building here is 38,800 square feet. So it's a little bit ha- less than half of what this building is. Interestingly, that project is going to cost us as much to do, actually a little bit more to do that project than it costs us to do this project in 1992, 93, we started in 92, got in in September of 94. And um, I say that to say this to you. I, people uh, ask me sometimes about it, and I just it's a good time for, us to, for me to remind you, we're, we're one church in multiple locations. And uh, our uh, strategy for starting campuses is really a uh, countywide Northeast Florida strategy to get the gospel in uh, proximity to as many people as possible in what is a five county re- region. If you think of Nassau, Duval, Baker County, if you think about Clay County, St. John's County, and where we're located in um, our Oak Leaf campus is in Clay County, or it will be in Clay County when we build that facility. We have a facility in Mandarin which will allow us to reach down into St. John's County. We actually own land already in St. John's County. And then eventually we want to get in proximity where we can reach into uh, Baker County and into Nassau County, which would just really be an incredible thing. So we're one church in multiple locations. But I tell people this way a lot. We have one bank account. Isn't that a good thing? You know what that means? That means that Oak Leaf's not building a building. Trinity's building a building. Do you get that? And it's, it's the way that we're expanding our ministry outreach. And so I want to challenge you to be faithful in your giving. And uh, we really need a, about a couple hundred thousand more dollars between now and September to stay on track with this. And uh, you say, how are you going to get there if everybody would just be faithful in their regular weekly giving? Um, one of the things that I enjoy about the weekend, and this has been happening a lot lately, I get texts from people, usually starting on a Thursday night, Friday, sometime people start texting me things about church on Sunday. Pastor, I've got somebody that's coming with me on Sunday. I think they give me that warning because they don't want me to preach a bad sermon. Um, but uh, so I got somebody coming with me, somebody texted me Friday and said, hey, Pastor, I got somebody that's coming with me today, this week that's ready to get baptized. I'm telling you, that is an all-time, 100% favorite text that you'll get um, on a weekend. And uh, one of my favorite things to do, I do it every single, I either do it Saturday uh, in the evening or early on Sunday morning. I write out my tithe check and uh, put it in an offering envelope and bring it to church. And uh, it's an act of worship to be able to give and to be invested in the work of God. And I hope that you'll do that with us and pray about uh, our, uh, each of our campuses and what God's doing on all of them. Genesis chapter 3. <clears throat> so today is really uh, a fun kind of sermon for me to be able to teach you. I want you to, um, I want you to do this for me. And I, uh, I can be like a mile deep into this and, and realize it's hard to kind of jump into a mile deep subject. And it's a little different. I was talking to Tommy before the service today that, that sometimes when you preach things that have a little bit of, of typology to it, it's, it's, it's not as what I would call is, is black and white cut and dried. So I want to try to take what, what may be a little bit of an obscure subject and a little bit of a different approach to try to make it clear to you. When you come to Genesis chapter 3, 
you, you literally, if you can think about it in terms of, of a visual picture, you have God coming back into the Garden of Eden, the presence of the Lord coming into the Garden of Eden, and he, He's coming into what would have been a perfect creation and a perfect paradise, and He's walking among the ruins of paradise, and He's looking for His creation. He's looking for Adam and Eve, and He says to them, where are you? And they're in hiding. And Genesis chapter 3, we, we did paradise in crisis. That's the temptation. Paradise lost. That's the fall. And we're answering these questions, not just how did we get here, Genesis 1 and 2, but Genesis chapter 3, why is the world so broken? And, and why is our life so difficult, hard, sometimes why is everything in our lives falling apart the way that it falls apart? And the answer to that is simply this, that the result of sin has brought about devastating consequences in our life. And the truth is, Proverbs tells us this way, the way of the transgressor is hard, and the way back for a sinner to God is a hard way back. It's almost impossible. In fact, it is impossible, apart from God's help, to get back to the garden, to get back to the paradise, to get back in to the presence of God. In fact, the truth is man cannot save himself. He is utterly helpless. I mean, so helpless that what you find in Genesis chapter 3 amidst the darkness and the devastation is, is just a, a, a singular glimpse of light, of hope, of grace, and redemption. You, you find it. I'm only going to read one verse for sake of time in Genesis 3 and verse 15. We're going to use Genesis 3.15 and, and teach through the end of the chapter. But Genesis 3.15 is call, called, in, in theological terms, it's called the Proto-Evangelium. It's, it's actually the first gospel. It's a foreshadowing of the messianic promise and the fulfillment. And by the way, interestingly, it's, it's a promise made to Satan in the presence of Adam and Eve. And that promise is God's Word on how He's going to deal with evil and evildoers. He said, I will put enmity between thee and the woman and between thy seed and her seed. In other words, between um, those who follow you and those who are born of the woman, and it, the seed of the woman, the Messiah who comes, will bruise your head, literally crush you at the head, and you will bruise his heel. So what we're going to do is we're going to look at this prophetic word and promise that becomes the basis of God's redemptive work, and we're going to try to, in the, in the meaning of the tree of life, in the meaning of the coats of skin, and in the meaning, meaning of the sword and cherubims outside of the Garden of Eden, we're going to talk about the cross, <clears throat> the atonement, and the sword of God's judgment. And we're going to claim Genesis 3.15 and embrace God's plan of redemption. You see, let me tell you something. Here's a good father for you. Here's how good a father God is. He will not leave his creation in ruins and without hope. So what you see, first of all, is the tree of life points to the cross. The tree of life points to the cross. If you want to just write a, in, 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 if you're taking notes, you use the outline or you write in the margin of your Bible, just write this statement down. You, you need a Savior. You need somebody that is going to take the curse for you. You need somebody who is going to become a substitute for you, somebody that's going to deal with the effects of sin. Now, the tree of life is, is a really an amazing study. I was Again, I was talking to Tommy before the service a little bit. We were just kind of comparing <clears throat> notes and, and ways to communicate this. It, it, it is interesting. It wasn't probably until about 15, maybe even 20 years ago that, that I began to really be able to put 
um, words to not just what the Bible says in each individual chapter, but connect all the dots to the, to the biblical narrative. And when you come to this idea about the tree of life, it's really integral, not just to the, to the creation account, but the tree of life is really integral to understanding the biblical narrative or the biblical story. It's mentioned in three books of the Bible. The tree of life is mentioned in the book of Genesis. You've seen Genesis 2 and 3. It's mentioned five times in the book of Proverbs. It, it really, you could sum all of those statements up into this reality that it takes wisdom for you and I to be able to see how much we need the tree of life in order to deal with the complex realities of the life that we're living. And so there's, there's an importance about the tree of life. And then the tree of life plays a prominent role in the book of Revelation. Of all the things that God created and put in the garden, of all the trees, and, and they're plural in the garden, multiple trees, you, you, can, you can picture just a, 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 just a beautiful, orderly, organized, meaningful garden. There's only two trees that are named. One is the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and God says, of that tree, you are forbidden to eat of the fruit of that tree. By the way, let me tell you something. God restricts us from very few things. If you think about it, God places some restrictions on us, but they're, they're in reality much more um, uh, limited. In other words, there, there's not nearly as many as the restrictions as you think there is. But what God restricts you from, He restricts you from for your own good. If you, if you start with the premise that, hey, God's mean, narrow, angry, strict, you don't understand God. What He restricts you from, He restricts for your own good. But then the only other tree that He names is the tree of life. Now, what we, what we can glean from this, and I, I'm going to I'm going to suggest this to you, it's in your outline, that the tree of life, life was the source of renewal and restoration before the fall. You say, well, what does that mean? All right, so <clears throat> the tree of life is symbolic of what it means to be in a right relationship with God. It, it is what you need to have renewal and recovery for that which was lost in the fall. It actually is fulfilling out this, this truth that is revealed to us prior to the fall that, that even though man is made by God and God says about man a, as the crown jewel of creation that everything that God made was very good, man still had deficiencies or inadequacies. He had things that he could not um, do without. In fact, the first thing God says to him is, is it's not good for man to be alone. Now, if you've heard me talk over the years, right? I think that's actually both pretty telling and it's a little bit funny, right? Leave a man by himself for just a little bit and he'll get into trouble. That's prior to the fall, right? In fact, it says it's not good for man to be alone. I'm going to make a help meet for him. I'm going to give him a helper because he needs help. You say, well, wait a minute. If God made man and he put him in a garden in a perfect paradise, wasn't he perfect in the garden? Well, yeah, he, it was a perfect paradise, but man wasn't perfect. He had a need. He not just had a need for the woman, but he also had a need for God. Because God says, whatever it is that you're doing in the creation as, as, a, as, a, 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 as one that has dominion over all creation, that apparently there are times when you are going to need renewal and recovery in your life. Now, now, some people, and, and, and this is my personal opinion about it, I, I think you can make a case of this from Scripture, but I, I think what's implied here is that man needs constant renewal. You, you're like a battery that needs to be recharged. And the recharging for your battery is what you get from the presence of God. And so the tree of life was symbolic of, hey, if you keep going back to the tree, you get what you need from, from the work that you're doing in creation, from what you do, you get back from that tree of life. Derek Kidner, who wrote, I think, 
two of the best commentaries that you'll ever read, one on the book of Genesis and one on the book of Proverbs, said the tree of life bore the fruit of immortality and the river watered the garden of God. The tree and the river reappear in the end time vision of Ezekiel 47 one, verses 1 through 12 when the glory of God has returned. It's also found in the book of Revelation. So the Old Testament affirms that that which was lost with paradise and waits to be regained can be enjoyed by some measure here and now when a man walks with God. So prior to the fall, you needed the presence of God. After the fall, you need the presence of God. And by the way, in eternity, you need the presence of God. You cannot live without it. So God did not execute the penalty by taking Adam's life, but by banning him from the rejuvenating power of the tree of life. I'm going to come back to that in just a moment. But Genesis 3 and verse 22 is actually teaching us this. God was not angry and throwing man out of the garden. God was graciously and lovingly saying, I am not going to allow you to be preserved in your fallen condition in an immortal state where you will be fallen forever. I'm going to redeem you so that you can live forever, not in a fallen condition, but in a glorified body. Isn't that gracious on God's part? You say, well, how do you get there? Well, what the tree of life was before the fall, the cross becomes a source of redemption and restoration after the fall. You see, the issue of the tree of life is critical, must be dealt with. God says man can't eat of the tree and live forever, so he is graciously and lovingly going to remove us from the garden, restrict access to the tree of life so that we could be redeemed and we could come back into fellowship with God. Let me tell you something. If, if, if we, and I'll just do this really quick, if we are susceptible to the temptation that Satan has given to us and we become knowledgeable of good and evil, then you know what we're going to try to do? We're going to, we're, we are going to be absolutely bent on finding a way to save ourselves. Can I tell you what your, what your single greatest problem is in your life today? And by the way, single greatest problem in my life is I, I keep looking for a way to become righteous on my own. And if the tree was there, what would I keep trying to do? I keep trying to get back to the tree. You say, why would I do that? Well, think about this. We're, we're rational beings. In other words, we have a compelling desire to learn. We, we want more information. And in our desire to learn, we would go to the tree of life because we would see it as a way to get more knowledge and more information. We're relational beings. We have a desire to be loved. And, and so we are, we are going to keep trying to get back into the relationship with God because we know once we eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, we're cut off from the presence of God and, and, and we feel the absence of the relational, the community that we, we have in need with God. And we're eternal beings. Really? Eternal beings in that we have a desire to live. So here, here's the reality about every one of you. You want to learn, you want to be loved, and you want to live. And God says, I'm not going to have you tempted by that tree of life so that you stay in this fallen condition forever. So God says, if that tree, the tree of life, cannot save you, then we need another tree. Here's the narrative. You say, what's the other tree? Well, do you know what the Bible says in the book of Deuteronomy? That cursed is everyone that hangs upon a tree. What is that? It's just a foreshadowing. If the tree of life could not save you, then what we need is a tree of death that is going to become the source of everlasting eternal life. And so in the Garden of Eden, God said to, me, to Adam before the fall, obey me about the tree and you will live. And Adam and Eve disobeyed God and they began to die. And if you fast forward centuries later in the Garden of Gethsemane, in the garden among the olive trees, God the Father says to God the Son, obey me about the tree and you will die. See, just the opposite happened. And Jesus Christ, 
willingly went to the cross, and the cross became a tree of death to Jesus so that the cross of Jesus Christ could become a tree of life for you and me. God did not, in a narrow, restrictive, angry way, cut Adam and Eve off from the tree of life. He, in a gracious way, said, there will be another tree, and it is the cross that becomes the means of salvation for you. So the tree of life points to the cross. And secondly, we see the coats of skin, skin point to the atonement. Not only do you need a Savior, <clears throat> but you need a substitute or you need a covering. You absolutely need it. In fact, if you just think through how this story unfolds, God comes into the garden, right, in chapter 3 and verse 8, and they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord amongst the trees of the garden. So they're hiding in the trees, and, and the Lord God called unto Adam and he said, where are you? And he said, I heard thy voice in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. And he said, who told you that you were naked? Now, you know, that is the only question that God asked directly that doesn't get a direct answer. Who gave you of the tree? Well, the woman gave me the tree, of the, of the fruit of the tree, right? Where are you? I'm hiding because I was naked. But the question, who told you you were naked, doesn't get answered. The reason it doesn't get answered is this. It, it's, it's a self-awareness. It's what happened as a result of eating the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And what that actually means is the moment that, that Adam and Eve fell into sin and the effect of that is passed on to you, you become aware. And you become aware not just of your sin, you become aware of your brokenness. You become aware of your inadequacy. You become aware of your insufficiency, and you begin to live with this desire, this incredibly strong need to cover up. You know, I, I, I actually did this the other day, and um, COVID changed a lot of things. Has COVID changed a lot of things for us without thinking about it? Um, my, my favorite way to study is to get up early, and I have a very, very n repeatable routine. And I, I can get so into studying when I start early. The other day I looked up, it was 1030, and I, I, mean, I was still in my pajamas, and I was studying. I was just, I was just knocking work out. And, and by the way, I've even had calls with people, and, you know, I'll, I'll comb, I haven't taken a shower yet, but I'll comb my hair, and they can see me from here up. You know, they don't know I'm still in my pajamas, right? I'm just these Zoom calls with people. And, but I just want to get back to my studying, right? And that works until somebody surprisingly just shows up at your door. And then you say to them something like this, hey, I've got to put some clothes on. Now, you know what that means, right? That doesn't mean I'm sitting there in my office naked. It means I'm not presentable, right? I'm, 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 I, you, you can't see me like this. And, and we all get that, right? But let me tell you something. Psychologically, that's how we all live. We don't want anybody to see us like we really are, so we work to cover ourselves up. Look at your outline. We say it this way. You cover yourself, or if, if, you, if you see, we need covering for our shame and guilt. We, we can't survive without it. Nakedness, the idiom that's used here, is what makes you feel vulnerable and exposed. It what, it's what really reinforces this reality that you're deeply flawed. I, I know this is awkward. We don't, we don't want to talk about this, Right? But do you sense your deep flaw? Do, do you know why that you have this need to win every argument? Because you're trying to justify yourself. Do you know why you continually compare yourself to others and you find you, you pick at the faults of other people? And it, even if you don't express it out loud, you do it in your mind because is, if you're better than them, you're justifying yourself. We have this need to do it. 
And we're doing it because we, we cannot deal with the shame and guilt in our lives, so we need a covering. When you're living with shame and guilt, when you're riddled by it, you pressure yourself to perform to be accepted. Like, like that's why some of you, you, you know, the ultimate test of your worth is can you keep your house clean, ladies? Right? Men, the ultimate test of your self-worth is what you accomplish. Let, let, me, let, me, let me be specific. Here's how we make a covering for ourselves. You cover yourself by overworking to prove your worth. You don't want to work. You, you don't want to be addicted to it. You don't want to be addicted to success, but you, you find yourself working hard because you get value from how you perceive that other people see you. And if they see you as a successful person, if they see you as a hard worker, can, can I make a confession to you? This, this is not true in my life today because I'm, I'm way more um, mature and, and spiritually rooted and grounded than I ever used to be. But I remember, I mean, I, mean, I remember when I first started pastoring, I wouldn't leave the office at the end of the day until the last person left because I wanted to feel good about myself, and I would think to myself, well, those lazy people, they all went home early. <laughs> that didn't make me a better pastor. That didn't make me a better person. That, that didn't make me more acceptable to God. I wasn't doing it because I was really trying to be successful. I was doing it because I was trying to make me feel good about me. Some of you overwork, and you're riddled by guilt because you know you're sacrificing in other areas of your life to do this thing that you think is giving you value. You're covering yourself. That's your fig leaf. You cover yourself by unhealthy behavior because you don't, don't want to disappoint others. By the way, I'm, I'm actually pointing out things that are really struggles for me. You, you know, there's, there's, it, it's hard for me to say no to people. You know why it's hard for me to say no to people? Because I want people to like me. Right? Do you know that you can say yes to so many people that you actually put yourself into the deficit behavior that you actually can't meet everybody's expectation? So why do I keep saying yes to people? Why, why do I keep doing more than I could? Because I don't want to disappoint people because I'm getting my worth and value from what other people think about me. That's a fig leaf. Here's another fig leaf. You tolerate unhealthy relationships with people because you get your worth from people that are close to you. So, see, some of you have, have really, you, you, you have what we often kind of refer to in, in counseling is, is unhealthy relationships with people, codependent relationships with people. You tolerate unhealthy relationships with people because even though those people are unhealthy, having a relationship with them makes you look good to other people. You're, you're known and valued by the people that think well of you. you say, That's a fig leaf, right? And you're, you're fostering that unhealthy relationship. Our fig leaves do not work. They do not cover us up. The performance that you're doing, the things that you're valuing, what you think it is that's going to save you actually cannot deal at the heart of what you need with the shame and guilt in your life. You do not need more fig leaves. What you need is the hand of God to come in and cover you. You need covering for your shame and guilt. But you also need covering to come back into the presence of God. So this is the this is the overarching narrative or the theme. God's going to banish them from the garden. And he doesn't say, hey, you can't come back. He's just saying you can't come back on your own. Something's got to happen in order for you to come back. So what God does is in the banishment, he makes them a coat of skins. What God does is he takes an animal, an innocent animal, a lamb perhaps, he kills the animal. He takes the skin of the animal, and he gives it to Adam and Eve. And in that coat of skins, which, by the way, is the same Hebrew word for priestly garments. 
See, if the garden is really teaching us anything, it's teaching us that, that the garden is paradise and the garden is where the presence of God is. And you cannot come into the presence of God naked. You cannot come into the presence of God flawed. You cannot come into the presence of God in your sin. You need covering. That picture is acted out in the Old Testament tabernacle and in the Old Testament and New Testament temple. And the high priest, only one priest who was above all the other priests, on one day of the year could bring one sacrifice into the temple, into the one holy place, the holy of holies, and that high priest, that one priest, would go in one day of the year in his priestly garments with the blood of an innocent animal, and he would take the blood of the innocent animal, and he would offer it on the mercy seat between the cherubims, and he would come into God's presence so that God could forgive them of their sin. This is the picture that God's given to you. You cannot come into my presence without being covered, without an atonement, without a provision being made for you. You owe a debt, and that debt has to be paid, and only through the blood of an innocent animal and the covering of that atonement can you come back into the presence of God. You need atonement. You need covering. And without it, there's no way back. That thirdly brings us to this. The flaming sword points to judgment. You know, I, I enjoy more today than ever uh, teaching the Bible. And I'm actually getting into a rhythm of enjoying the way that church is functioning for us. And I do a lot of the, what I would call the primary content development, and then we have a very collaborative effort between our, our teaching pastors where, where we are collectively working through it. And, and because of my age and experience and position, I, I get to have a lot of influence on that. And sometimes the most enjoyable part of teaching for me is helping to teach people that are going to be teaching this. And... I could sense that there was a little resistance, not, not, not in a bad way, but in a normal way, a little resistance to, hey, we're going to spend five weeks in Genesis 3 and 4, and we're going to talk a lot about sin and brokenness. And I'm thinking, yeah, if you knew how sinful and broken these people are we're going to preach to, you'd think we need more than five weeks. We need like 52 weeks on that subject. And then if they knew how sinful and broken we are that are preaching to them, they'd say, hey, you need to like spend about 10 years on this subject, right? We need it. And, and we, we like to think of the Bible. We, we, we like, you know, like there's some really cool things in the Bible, right? Like who wouldn't want to talk about David killing Goliath? I mean, just, let's just talk about that every week. That's, you know, the ultimate underdog always wins. Well, that's not really what that story is teaching us. What that story is actually teaching us is this, is that the glory of God is, is so matchless that anybody or anything that would, would, would stand against God's glory deserves to be confronted, and we ought to give our lives for the glory of God to protect the name of God. That's, that's what that lesson's about. What you see there is that the Bible actually is unpacking this theme that, that judgment is coming. You see judgment in Genesis 3. You see judgment in the flood. You see judgment at the Tower of Babel. You see judgment in the, in the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. You see judgment when the children of Israel go back into the promised land. You see judgment all throughout the Bible. You see judgment in Noah, in, in Jonah. You see judgment in, in the, the Assyrians and the Babylonians carrying away the children of Israel. You see judgment all throughout the Old Testament, and then you come to the New Testament, and, and actually the Bible reinforces that by saying this, it's appointed that a man once to die, and after this, the judgment. I don't want you to ever 
one time in your life have this thought that you can come to church and, and sit here in a service and hear me preach, in particular on a day like this, and not be fully warned that the storm of God's judgment is coming and it has to come because of what happened in the Garden of Eden. We talk about, you know, in Florida, you know what we're all about? Preparing for hurricanes. Right? So you know what we do? We buy water and toilet paper and perishable items, and we stock up. Let me tell you something. There's a hurricane coming that you can't do anything to prepare for other than come to Jesus Christ by faith. The storm of God's judgment is coming. Now, let me tell you, we oftentimes misunderstand what judgment is really like. It's Father's Day. I've mentioned my father to you. Let me tell you a little bit about him. I have three brothers, no sisters. I have a loving, gracious, really good mom. It's hard raising, boy, we're all 16 months apart, four of us, boom, 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 boom. And my brothers are horrible people. (laughs) And they needed a strong disciplinarian. And and I I got one too, not because I needed it, because I just happened to be in a family of, of sinners. Right? And sometimes my mom, by the way, my mom copyrighted this phrase, wait until your father gets home. And sometimes my dad would come home, and this is my dad saying. He, my dad can be very patient. He's very, he comes across very merciful. He, he's an assassin, but you just don't know it, right? And he'd, he'd say, well, just, you know, y'all just, we're going to eat dinner, and we'd eat dinner. And he said, you're not going to go outside and play. And we'd think, okay, well, that's the punishment for whatever it is that mom told him that we did. And then he'd say, I want you all to go get a bath. And you know, you'd think, okay, that sounds like a good idea. And then you realize, okay, he's going to whip you before you get dressed. You know, I mean, it's, I mean, it's, it's brutal, right? And I would rationalize with my dad. I'd say, you don't, you don't understand. I, I didn't, I, whatever it was that they did, I did not do. And in my mind, the rationalization was, I mean, it was perfect rationalization. Any thinking human being that had, a, had any ounce of mercy at all would have said, yeah, you're right. You don't deserve this punishment. Not my dad. He said, well, you may not have done this. He said, but there's been things you've done that you haven't been punished for. I mean, it was just, I mean, it was, you know, it was like nuclear war. Let me tell you something. When God comes into the garden, he's not angry. He's not mean-spirited. He's not destructive. He's merciful. What you see is the mercy of God's judgment. He makes a distinction between evil, the disobedience of Adam and Eve, and evildoers, Satan. Here's how merciful God is. He, 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 he removes them from the garden, restricts their access to, to the tree of life so that they would not be trapped eternally in their fallen and unredeemed state. He does not exhibit anger. What he actually does is he begins to set in motion a redemptive plan that was in place from the beginning of time, and he covers them with the coats of skin to protect them physically and physiologically and psychologically and spiritually. And he says to them, I'm going to judge, but I'm going to judge you in mercy. And there's not only the mercy of God's judgment, but there's the justice of God's judgment. A great type. So he takes Adam and Eve, and he puts them out of the garden. And on the east side of the garden, he puts the cherubims. The cherubims are two representations of of angelic being. They're guardians of the glory of God. And there with the two cherubims is this flaming sword that's turning in every single direction. It's symbolic of this. You can't get back into paradise. You can't get back into the garden. You can't get back into the presence of God unless you go under the sword. Do you know what Isaiah says about Jesus? It says that the Messiah would come and he would be cut 
off from the land of the living. What does that mean? It means this, that the Messiah is going to come and he's going to be, he's going to be cut off. He's going to go under the sword of God's judgment. What, what God is saying to Adam and Eve and what he's picturing for us is this, judgment is inevitable. Judgment is a sure thing. Judgment is going to be faced by everybody. But let me tell you this, you do not have to face that judgment because the Messiah, Jesus Christ, is going to come, and he's going to go under the sword of God's justice for you, and the justice of God and the judgment of God is going to be satisfied by Jesus Christ. And if, if you believe in him, if you take what he does for you on the cross and you appropriate that into your life, you will be spared. You will have access back into my presence. You may look at that and say, I don't know. I wish God would have come up with a, a, another way. There's got to be multiple ways back to God. Let me tell you something. It's of the mercy of God that there's any way at all for us. Here's the only way. Jesus Christ took your place. And he went to the cross for you. He went to the tree of life and died so that you could be covered with his blood so that when the storm of God's judgment comes towards you and you stand before God, God's going to let you back in to his presence eternally because of what he's done for you. That's the gospel glimpse that you get in Genesis. That's the gospel glimpse that you need to hold on to in your life and you need to receive. Let's stand together for prayer. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. Mark's going to come and lead us as we close today. We've got somebody who's going to follow the Lord in baptism. By the way, if you're a Christian, you never follow the Lord in baptism, you can join them today. You can spontaneously say, hey, today's the day I'm going to follow Jesus I'm going to make that public in my life. You just come, we'll help you get ready right away to do that. If you're not a Christian today, I, I encourage you to call on Jesus. You can scan that QR code on the Next Steps card. You can fill that out and come see us at one of the tables. You can come here to the front right now. We'll have a conversation with you. You can put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ today, and you can escape you can embrace God's plan of redemption and escape the coming storm of God's judgment in your life. Or you can apply that truth subjectively in your life and free you from having to perform to get your righteousness. That your righteousness is not based on how you do what you do, it's based on what Jesus Christ did for you. Father, speak to us. Make the, the gospel glimpse from Genesis come real to us. Help us to grab hold of it in a way that it transforms us forever. I pray that you'd save people in their sin, from their sin. And I pray, God, that you would help people to apply the truth of the gospel to their lives. In Jesus' name, amen.